So we can continue with the next presentation by Matis Blossfield about the DTRF 2020, the ITRS 2020 realization of the DGFI. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, so I'm going to talk on behalf of Manuela Seitz, who's the primary investigator of the ITS Combination Center, hosted at our institute about um, our realization of the ITRS, the DTRF uh, 2020. Oh no. Oh, yeah. uh, first of all, I want to use this slide in order to emphasize that the ITS realization computations is a really um, large effort by uh, numerous entities of the geodetic infrastructure of the International Association of Geodesy. So within the IAG, you have several ILS stations which uh, observe or where the data is taken since 1983. Um, these stations forward their observations via the data centers and the operation centers to the ILS Analysis Standing Committee, so the seven ACs, where all of the ACs are using uh, several software packages. Uh, then these uh, analyzed data sets are forwarded again via the data centers to the ILS Combination Centers. The ILS is hosting two combination centers in RC and JSET. And finally, this ILS contribution is then forwarded to the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, where the combination is then done with the other techniques at three different ITS combination centers, one hosted at IGN in Paris, one at DGFI in Munich, and one in JPL uh, in Pasadena in the US. Um, I want to emphasize that the, all the three ITS realizations are based on exactly the same input data, which is provided by all of the IAG services, and the differences you see are mostly or solely related to different combination strategies and the software packages we are using at the different combination centers. Usually, ITS realizations are uh, computed every five to six years to ensure a high accuracy and precision. Uh, the input data looks like this. It's here split it upon all the different uh, techniques. Uh, a highlighted SLR, so in total we have 1,700 Zynex files um, provided by the ILS, which, is, which are covering a time span of roughly 38 years. So this is really impressive that the ILS is already nearly four decades contributing um, observations to these long-term reference frame realizations. Um, on the right-hand side of this uh, plot, you see the parameters uh, the Earth orientation parameters beside the station coordinates which are forwarded to us. You see that the ILS is providing pole offsets and LOD. And for example, the IVS VLBI is providing all the EOPs since this technique is sensitive to all of the Earth orientation parameters. Compared to the DTRF 2014, the previous realization of the ITRS, our, our institute, um, we faced a completely new situation this time. First of all, for sure, we have longer observation time spans, so six years more data. We have new stations on site. We have new hardware at the stations. For some techniques, we have newly launched satellites, which are incorporated into the solution, and new measured local ties had been available. Uh, on the analysis side, uh, several model updates had been taking place. For example, in the general case, so for all techniques, the secular pole model was updated. Techniques specifically for uh, GNSS, the uh, satellite uh, phase center uh, variations in set direction had been pre-calibrated for the Galileo satellites. So this allows GNSS now for the first time to provide an independent scale realization. In case of SLR, we are facing these target signatures and the long-term mean range biases, which are estimated by the analysis standing committee. And this has a significant impact on the SLR scale this time. I will talk about this, this later. Um, to conclude, all these model changes will for sure affect the station coordinates we estimate, the station velocities, but also the commonly estimated EOP as well as the DTRF uh, geodetic datum parameters, the scale, the origin, and the orientation. Um, on the right-hand side of this slide, you see the computation algorithm, um, how the DTRF is computed at our institute. I don't want to go into detail here. Take-home messages from uh, this flowchart are, first of all, we do a combination of the techniques at the normal equation level. Moreover, the computation is, is split up in a two-step approach, approach. First, in an intra-technic combination, we analyze the data and compute one 
terrestrial reference frame uh, solution per technique. So there is an ILS only reference frame available based on the official ILS input data. And secondly, we then in an inter-technique combination step uh, combine the different techniques to a multi-technique uh, DTREF 2020 terrestrial reference frame. What is new uh, in the DTREF 2020 realization compared to 2014? First of all, what is written here in the upper part again, in the first step, we correct for non-tidal loading site displacements. So we used a model provided by the GGFC, the Global Geophysical Fluid Center, um, which allows us to account for site displacements of, uh, due to atmospheric, hydrological, and oceanic loading. This is um, reduced at the neck level, so at the normal equation level. And secondly, we um, correct for post-seismic deformation um, by an approximation of a combination of logarithmic and exponential functions. These corrections are also reduced at the normal equation level. Um, the non-tidal loading input data, as I said before, is provided by GGFC uh, based on different geophysical models. First of all, we sum up all the different um, constituents, then we detrend these time series for the stations because we do not want to mitigate um, uh, non-tidal loading data into the estimated velocities of the DTREF. Uh, and finally, we consider this non-tidal loading in each single input normal equation. Um, like this, the normal equation itself is not changed, but the right-hand side of the equation system and the square sum of the residuals, a priori um, values are also remain the same. When you do so, here shown for an example in uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, then in the upper blue, in the upper panel of the blue time series is the uncorrected time series. The model is shown in the lower panel, and if you subtract this, then you end up with this uh, orange colored smoother time series, which can be better approximated by uh, station velocities. When we do this for all the techniques, I highlighted here SLR again, only stations where 100 or more solutions had been available. Then you see the WRMS, so the station repeatability in all three components is decreasing, and it's mostly decreasing for GNSS. Um, when we look on the median change of the, uh, the median of the RMS change, then we see that in total for the 85 stations of the ILS network, um, we only have slight uh, improvements, but for other techniques, it's really beneficial to account for this non-tidal loading effects. What is the impact on the uh, datum parameters? On the left-hand side, there's an example for the Z translation, the intrinsic um, origin um, information of SLR. You see over the whole time span, including the late GS1 uh, era, um, the situation is quite uh, convenient, so quite smooth. If we correct for non-tidal loading, we again, again end up with this orange-colored time series. If you do a lomps gargle amplitude spectrum of this time series, you see that the annual signal as well as the semi-annual signal are clearly reduced. So we take out systematics of the uh, SLR data or SLR origin. For the GNSS scale, you see also that the time series is very smooth and that mainly the uh, annual amplitude is is uh, reduced in the lomps gargle amplitude spectrum. If we look on the second uh, renewal of uh, the DTREF, uh, within the DTREF 2020, the uh, post-seismic deformation approximation, we used a software called Apropos, developed at our institute, which basically is um, a combination of logarithmic and exponential functions. Uh, this is somehow a nonlinear optimization problem. Um, the approximation is done either in XYZ or northeast up component. Um, here on the right-hand side, you see an example uh, of the Mitsuzawa station in Japan. There was an earthquake, and you see in blue the original time series provided to us. And when we fit our model through the time series in here in the north and the east component, then you see we end up with this orange time series again, so quite um, well um, able to, to, that, we, that we are able to fit a linear velocity through these uh, time series. Um, Mostly GNSS stations had been affected by post-seismic deformation, which has to be modeled. For SLR, there were only two stations affected, Tigo and, and Arequipa, and there also the model was fitted through the data. For the DTF 2020, about 1,880 observing stations had been processed. You see here the uh, 
the plot, the, the global plot of the stations, color coded for the different techniques. And what we have to do is, due to equipment changes, geophysical phenomena or whatever, when there's an abrupt change in the time series, we have to introduce a discontinuity, so re-estimate offsets and velocities. And you see for the, for the majority of uh, discontinuities, um, we have to introduce them for the GNSS time series, for SLR only a couple of time series. But what actually is the consequence of this? What you see here is for the different uh, techniques um, separated the observation time span. So on the x-axis you see the observation time span, on the y-axis are the stations sorted by the length of their observation time span. And what you clearly see is that SLR and VLBI are providing a solid basis of overlapping station observation time spans of 15 years and more. So the networks are very stable. Whereas for the other two techniques, you see such a strange pattern here, which means, in fact, the number of discontinuities leads to a fragmentation. There is, roughly speaking, a Doris TRF before 2005, and it's not really the same one as after 2005. And this brings a couple of problems into the game, and therefore we have to introduce velocity constraints and co-motion constraints for solution numbers as well as inter-technique collocations, which you see here. For Doris, this was handled with 161 constraints, for GNSS with 1,347. Okay, coming to the most important part, the DTRF datum. Uh, first of all, the origin component is realized by SLR only uh, using the full history, so including the Lages 1 um, era data set. The orientation is, host, is realized by mathematical constraint. The, trend, uh, the scale is a bit more complicated. So for the first time, we have three techniques which provide a reliable scale information, SLR, VLBI, and GNSS. Um, we try to assess uh, this point by, analyze, by the analysis of the scale agreement where we compute test solutions using individual scale parameters for the different techniques or both of them. And we see a very good agreement of the scale uh, between uh, GNSS and VLBI, so at the submillimeter level, whereas SLR, as shown here in this dark purple line, shows a small offset uh, with respect to the other two microwave techniques at the reference epoch 2010.0 and a small drift. This drift then accumulates when you extrapolate uh, this uh, uh, scale information into the past or into the future. That's why um, we decide when we combine SLR with the other technique, nothing goes wrong. Uh, the solution is quite stable, but this time to keep the offset small, uh, the small offset and the drift visible for further studies, um, the DTRF 2020 scale is realized from the two good agreeing techniques, VLBI and GNSS only. I want to emphasize that this is not a decision on wrong or right at this time, but we want to keep this, uh, this scale offset and the rate uh, obviously included in the DTRF in order to perform analysis what might uh, cause, uh, causing, what, what is my, probably causing this effect. Finally, what you see here is the horizontal velocity field, as it will be published very, very soon, hopefully. So to conclude, uh, I want to thank the ILS again for this uh, high efforts uh, and the high quality SLR-TF contribution which was provided to the combination centers. The DTRF solution is uh, constructed like this, that SLR is uniquely realizing, so exclusively realizing the origin. Scale is realized by um, VLBI and GNSS. Uh, the outlook is that within the next week slash days, uh, the solution will be published and made available uh, publicly. We are currently working on internal validations and uh, the release will contain Sinex files and EUP files as well as these model correction parameters in order to make the user able to reconstruct the full signal uh, to perform um, the, uh, the own, their own analysis um, for this. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matis. Are there any questions uh, on the, from the audience? I have a question. So, thank you, Matis. Um, how did you propose that users of your DTRF 2020 frame that want to use it for POD or orbit validation 
use it when they want to use SLR to do this validation because you will make the SLR frame to adopt the scale uh, that comes from GNSS and VLBI. So will they have to apply a helmet or what will they have to do? Uh, no, they don't have to apply helmet. They have to apply uh, the range biases or that's uh, currently under discussion at this point, how to use the new realizations like the I2F or the D2F or the J2F for um, POD. There will be in the next session some talks on this issue, how to use these uh, reference frames, but basic or roughly speaking, uh, the ILS community do, does not have to apply any uh, helmet transformation parameters in order to use the D2F to perform a POD. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, my question is very short. Uh, in, in order to obtain a better, even, even better uh, TRF, what would be the key? I mean, what, what, should, we, what should we change? Uh, or what, what is the largest error source? Ah, yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, so first of all, we have um, the, the, the ILS contribution to the reference frame is mainly based on four satellites only. So we have LAGES 1-2, we have ETALON 1-2, who are mainly contributing. The ETALON satellites are not that well tracked, so we have the majority of data coming from the LAGES satellites, but there are plenty of other spheres tracked by the ILS stations very, very frequently. Uh, and we should try to, uh, to incorporate all these observations which are lying there um, into a uh, reference frame product or contribution of the ILS. Thank you. Okay, we have three questions from the online. Uh, Dramatis Zwer mentioned in his presentation that ITRF 2020 estimated GNS as draconic harmonic signals from the GNSS station time series. Was this also the case in uh, DTRF 2020? Yeah. No, we do not estimate any periodic signals. We uh, account for non-linear station variations by um, applying a non-tidal loading correction, so a correction based on a geophysical model, obviously not including draconitic periods. So they are still in the, in the, in the time series of the genesis uh, available. Okay, thank you. I'm going to the second. Up to DTRF. Uh, 2014, DGFI always claims that there is no scale offset between VULBI and SLR. With the ITRF 2020 data, SLR scale has changed by about 1 ppb upward. So I was expecting to see SLR scale above VULBI by about 1 ppb. But you show now, slide 12, that SLR scale is below VULBI. Can you explain why, please? Yeah, um, that's a, a good question and a tricky uh, answer, let's say. Um, let me try to um, wrap up everything. Um, the the D2F 2020 scale is uh, realized from uh, GNSS and VLBI only. In comparison to this, at the reference epoch 2010.0, we see an offset of roughly two point something millimeters and a small drift. So and now you have to take two things into account when you talk about these scale offsets or intercompare the techniques. First of all, the reference epoch and the drift. So if you do the same comparison at another epoch, the drift will affect this offset. So um, at the epoch 2000, for example, we will see a larger offset compared to the epoch 2010. And then, unfortunately, the second aspect you have to take in mind is that all these um, scale offset estimates are based on uh, helmet transformation and we are still suffering also within the ILS and not, how to say, optimal global station coverage. So the helmet transformation um, is quite tricky to do and this is still an ongoing uh, topic in our investigations. Thank you. Last question. Maybe you answer on the first, but uh, I read the Anyway, dear Mattis, uh, as a corollary, did you estimate the JSON draconic signals from the Doris contribution in DTRF 2020? No, same as for GNSS, only geophysical site displacements are corrected. Oh, there is a very last question by Zwer. I'm still confused. As you showed, the SLR scale drift is small, 0 0.1 millimeter per year. This makes a scale change of 1 millimeter over 10 years and so does not explain the results you showed. 
Um, so it's, it's, uh, you can see these uh, results in the, in the time series plot. Uh, I showed in slide 12, I think. Um, again, um, these uh, numbers are based on helmet transformations um, using only a very small number of stations. Unfortunately, I also wish that the situation is better, but we have uh, the ILS network as it is now. And uh, we are still investigating how to, to get a better feeling for these uh, different scale realizations. Okay. okay, I think we can proceed. We are a bit late. Thank you. Thank you, Mathis.